On April 8th, news of legendary pop singer-songwriter Taylor Swift and actor Joe Alwyn's breakup shocked the world. Entertainment Tonight was the first to pick it up with People magazine and even CNN confirming it days later. This all happening in the midst of Swift's record-breaking Eras tour and just a day before Easter Sunday, which in itself also shook the world when, spoiler, I'll preface this video by saying a couple of things. I fully respect and see both Taylor and Joe as people and artists. This video will not spend speculate the specific how or why behind their breakup, because we don't know any of it and we aren't owed any form of explanation behind it. It's their private lives, even when we consider Swift's career and discography has been shaped by the discourse of it. This video is strictly about how I've come to reevaluate and admire Midnight's even more with this recent news. I spent the last weekend re-listening to Swift's discography, I spent a whole afternoon listening to Lover, partly in mourning, I'll admit, then I sat down and heard Midnight's for the first time in a while and something really clicked for me. In my previous video about Midnight's, which focused on the business aspects of the record and my initial review, I assigned the album a 7.7 for the standard edition. My core complaint being a lack of thematic cohesion, but what if there really is a theme, even if it wasn't the initial intention? I'm personally sick of people making jokes about TS11 being Red 2.0 or how it's going to be amazing because it'll be a heartbreak record. For one, it's very dehumanizing and for another, we might might already have that record and that would be Midnight's. Hear me out, Midnight's might not completely fit into the mold of a traditional breakup record, but it contains some pretty dark songs that allude to the downs of a long-term relationship. Midnight's never aimed to be something like Starcross by Casey Musgraves, which outright tells you what it aims to be. Instead, it's always been amorphous, almost akin to life itself. Events that have happened but don't take meaning until we apply context to them long after they've passed. Again, I'm not going to speculate on specific Specifics, but let's evaluate the lyrics and the themes found throughout each song on Midnight's from the lens of a breakup narrative. I argue that even the romantic songs on the back half of the standard edition contain a bittersweetness to them that backs this reading. From this point onwards, we're not talking about Swift per se, but rather the narrator of Midnight's as a fictional character with their own arc. Like how some people have personified reputation as a person when discussing the album, we're gonna do the same to Midnight. Oh, and we're not using any of the 3AM tracks either, I love them, but this is a re-evaluation of the standard edition. I noted in my first review that Lavender Hay sounded like a sister to I Think He Knows sonically, but when we look at lyrics, particularly the verses, they don't seem as romantic as its counterpart. Verse 1 paints a picture of a narrator whose partner seems closed off and disaffected rather than understanding and open. The pre-chorus in the songs contradict this reading, but the chorus itself speaks less about a relationship and more about the expectations behind it. Taylor herself described what the phrase Lavender Haze meant to her. I happened upon the phrase Lavender Haze when I was watching Mad Men, and it turns out that it's a common phrase used in the 50s where they would just describe being in love. You were in the Lavender Haze, then that meant that you were in that all-encompassing love glow. Theoretically, when you're in the Lavender Haze, you'll do anything to stay there and not let people bring you down off of that cloud. I'd like to emphasize the last part about how you'll do anything to stay there and not let people bring you down off that cloud. The 1950s shit clearly refers to traditional marriage and maternal roles. It's also a play on the eternal Madonna whore complex every pop star must confront. Something continued in verse two. The bridge plays with the idea of maintaining this lavender haze at all cost, where love is treated as a spiral, which even satirically, still alludes to a demise of some kind. In my initial review, I didn't love it as an opener, but now it just feels like a foreboding warning. Maroon's placement after Lavender Haze makes a lot more sense if this record is really about the fear of losing a relationship and ruminating over what could happen, mostly for worse. The track references long-running motifs like Weinstein clothes, here a shirt over a dress. It also revisits the motif of love being represented by the color red, but instead of burning, it's more of a muted, rusty maroon weathered by time time, distance, and age. One thing I didn't really notice until I re-listened is that this track is in past tense almost like a suspended memory. One of the lines in verse two that we can't really overlook is carnations you had thought were roses, that's us. In some European countries, carnations are funeral flowers. The relationship is dead. In a meta text sense, a TikTok user at Invisible Theme pointed out that she explicitly uses rubies in this verse, which were one of the Taymojis in the Swift Life app for the song King of My Heart. 
This is an odd but direct link to Reputation as an album, which the song sonically evokes as well. And of course, a quick shout out to The Bridge, which remains one of her most haunting to date. Antihero contains brief moments of paranoia and fear of a relationship breaking up in the pre-chorus, once for the partner leaving because of scheming, and another alluding to life losing its meaning. But it's really The Bridge itself, while jokey, that reveals a lot. It doesn't paint the idea of family or children in a positive light, continuing a disdain for marriage and tradition such up in the first track. The assumption that the narrator's child would be so bad at love that they marry someone who kills their parent for the money, we need to unpack that. I think it's such a clever, complicated fear to have that a product of your love, your own child, and their own love life choices would be your demise. It's very layered. We're skipping Snow at the Beach because it's straightforward, lovely, and the only collaboration on this record. Quick self-promo, check out my Lana Del Rey video essay series if you want my thoughts on her discography. I had so much fun making that. I think it's common knowledge that track fives are known for being devastating, but you're on your own, kid. Thematically is about the narrator shifting their dreams away from true love to being comfortable being alone, but gaining agency to do what they want to do in life. In the bridge, I need to emphasize two lines, like I'd be saved by a perfect kiss and I saw something that they can't take away. The first is a direct call out against romance in general as the ultimate answer, while the second is a direct reference to the narrator. They can't take away their talent, their ambition, or their agency. A secondary theme that I noticed in Midnight's is the emphasis on agency. The idea of agency is very tricky to talk about, not just from an individual sense, but particularly in a relationship. Oftentimes you need to sacrifice parts of your agency in order to maintain a happy relationship. So what more if you're not happy in your relationship? The most obvious direct breakup song on this record is Midnight Rain. The song itself being about the narrator and their ex wanting clearly different things. I mean, the hook. He wanted a bride, I was making my own name. A direct callback to Lavender Haze, but with the breakup angle, the song, which almost seemed random on release date, makes all the more sense. Even more damning is, while the record has no title track, this happens to be at the center of the standard and contains the word Midnight in its title. It's the closest thing to a title track on this record and in my view, could be viewed as a thesis statement for the record, especially now. Question being track seven and the climax, if we put the standard version, of the album on a plot diagram reinforces this idea. It's yet another song about, you guessed it, a dead relationship. While it does sample Out of the Woods from 1989, the song details miscommunication, which seems to have doomed the relationship. Whether the song is about the narrator's current breakup or one from way before is irrelevant, these questions are eternal. In the bridge, the song poses some pretty deep hypotheticals, but it's a song from someone who wonders if their former lover has as many regrets as they do. Some have tried to tie it to Betty's POV from Folklore and others try to tie it to 1989's narrative. And there are a few of you who have tried to tie this to Fearless's The Way I Loved You, which really does speak to how Midnight's really is a crystallized meditation of career-long ideas and themes. We'll skip over Vigilante shit, which I did say in my last review would kill on tour, and it does. While I did love Bejeweled, it always did seem to rub me off in the wrong sort of way when I first listened to Midnight's, but seen as part of a long narrative about breaking free from a relationship, it really does work exceptionally well in its track placement. The line familiarity breeds contempt ties to the overall idea of feeling entrapped, not just by a relationship, but expectations. Verse 2 in particular contains some of my favorite lines. Graded on a curve feels very this is me trying coded, while the way that she sings I made you my world, have you heard I can reclaim the land, echoes tolerate it. But the most damning line is I miss you, but I miss sparkling. The last third of the record is where the breakup album theory gets a little bit wonky, but I think we can make it work and we might have a certain target bonus track up our sleeves to help us tie everything together. I said that Labyrinth was a standout that I really did admire atmospherically. I found it romantic at my first listening, but sitting down and really listening to the lyrics and reading them aloud, it's kind of tragic. The narrator's trauma starting the track as if they're talking about a panic attack. They also bring up their fear of elevators, then even compare the act of falling in love again to a plane going down. The only solace is the question, how do you turn it right around at the end? The act of comparing their mind to a labyrinth, essentially a maze meant to contain the Greek mythic beast, the Minotaur, it's very heavy. One line that I do have to call out is how they'd say that their muse would break their back to see them smile, which poses as a romantic sacrifice, but you need to consider the 
toll that it takes on both ends of the gesture. The production of the song itself is glitchy and haunted and ends abruptly. So did either lover truly escape the maze? Next we have karma, which we're gonna skip over. Great tour closer, let's just interpret that karma is not her literal boyfriend in the chorus, but metaphorically her boyfriend, someone who loves her. Sweet Nothing was one of my initial standouts, and still is. I debated not analyzing this one from the breakup perspective lens, especially since it's co-written with Joe, but I think we can glean some pretty cool observations that tie into the other songs on the record. Again, quick reminder, we're looking through Midnight's The Narrator's POV. I honestly think that the chorus itself could play into the themes of Midnight Rain with the lines, all that you ever wanted from me was sweet nothing and the very concept of sweet nothing. Sweet nothings are defined as romantic loving talks. However, these words of affection are often unimportant or trifling as per the Farlux Dictionary of Idioms definition. It's surface level at the end of the day, which is its own sort of luxury, but it's not sustaining. Which brings us to Mastermind, a song that never sat right with me, even in my original review. I think this quote helped me appreciate the song more. And while it is portrayed as romantic, I'm not really sure it is. If we're looking at this from a breakup lens, it almost seems like the narrator is a tragic figure, someone who has machined together a relationship for themselves and their muse, and put all of this effort into it. Double injury when it's revealed that the muse knew it the whole time and played along with it passively. Yes, it is cute that they played along, but it also underscores the inequity a mastermind had put into this whole thing. It's almost played off as a conquest in a way but it's a fyric victory, an exercise of the narrator's brilliance, but nonetheless something that was doomed by design. And if that interpretation doesn't work for you, I play my trap card hits different. The epilogue to the record if you bought the target version. I always questioned it being left off and how to staffed it really did feel from the other tracks, but if we view Midnight's as a heartbreak record, it slots right in as a perfect, pretty dark ending, pointing out the direct aftermath of a breakup. In the review, I really did speak for a minute about how magical this track is and how it's my favorite from this era. I still hold that opinion and I still wish that it was available on streaming. At the time of this recording, it is not on streaming. Hopefully it is one day. So what all of this is building up to is my conclusion. While there is strong evidence that counteracts my retrospective read of Midnight's as a breakup record, I really do like Midnight's the standard version in particular, a lot more than I did the first go around. Viewing it as a meditation on the grief of an impending breakup of some sort, whether that's from a person, a vision of your own life, or the expectations others have of you, gives it a very solid theme that may have been there the whole time, hidden in plain sight. I'm glad to award the standard edition a new rating of 8.5, Add an extra 0.2 if we're talking about the target version. Quick reminder that this is just my opinion, but I did want to share my reinterpretation of the record. It's unfortunate how I arrived to this conclusion, though I may be projecting my own thoughts looking back on my own breakups as well. But I do hope that if you stayed this long, maybe I've given you a new way to look at this record if you didn't like it the first go around. Maybe Midnight's was a breakup record this whole time. And that's a wrap. Thank you so much for watching this video and uh, feel Feel free to fight me in the comment section if you disagree. I'm okay with that. Like, this is kind of like a hot take. I've been seeing some people on TikTok also make this take, but I wanted to elaborate and give a song by song breakdown of this opinion. A quick shout out to my members. Thank you so much. I've been doing a lot of essays despite saying that I would go on a break. Maybe I'm just not on a break. Well, I'll see you next video.